Great. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Doing Business with FEMA, a general information session. I'm Jody Keenan. I'm the state director for the Virginia SBDC network. First, please let me share that all of us in the SBDC network hope that anyone on the call, that you and your families and neighbors are on the road to recovery after Hurricane Helene. I know there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, the SBDCs and the APEX team who you'll hear from today are resources in your community to help you with, with your business recovery. We are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our website at virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted and the chat feature is turned off. But if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of the session. We've also enabled the live transcript function, which you can show or hide using your meeting controls. So at this time, I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce Jessica Dotson, Program Manager for Southwest Virginia Community Apex Accelerator. Before joining Apex, Jessica worked in economic development and workforce development, and she specializes in developing and delivering professional training for businesses and individuals. Apex accelerators work nationwide to provide businesses with the marketing know-how and technical tools they need to obtain and perform successfully under federal, state, and local government contracts. Their mission is to create and retain jobs, foster competition, and lower costs for the government, helping to sustain our armed forces readiness. Jessica and her team at Southwest Virginia Community College work with companies uh, in Virginia from Roanoke South and throughout Southwest Virginia. There are two other Apex accelerators in Virginia, one is in Petersburg with the Greater Planning District, and they work with businesses across Southern Virginia, roughly from Hopewell to Martinsville. Um, and Virginia Apex at George Mason University that serves Northern Virginia, Central Virginia, the Valley, and Hampton Roads. So you all are well resourced in the Commonwealth to learn uh, and to have support to do business with the, the government, federal, state, and local. Um, let me just remind you um, about the SBA disaster declaration and the communities that are impacted. So if you're a business in one of these counties, uh, you have access, you're able to tap into some SBA financing. If you're a business looking to support and assist uh, the recovery and the rebuilding, these are the target communities that have been designated. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing here and ask Jessica. Um, Jessica is gonna present general information for those who are interested in the process of doing business with FEMA, including SAM registration, which is the system for award management. And you'll hear how to correctly fill out the disaster recovery response section for your business to be added to the disaster response registry. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Jessica, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Jody. You guys will just give me one moment. I will get my screen going here. Moment. <laughs> It wouldn't be a day if you didn't have to buy a PowerPoint. Oops. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Perfect. 
So Jody did a wonderful job introducing our Apex Accelerator program. So some of this is a bit redundant, but again, thank you guys so much for having us today. I'll begin with a little quick introduction to what the Apex Accelerators are, and then I'll be speaking about our main topic of doing business with FEMA and all of the required steps to do so. We have reviewed those submitted questions and we've done our best to tailor the presentation to cover most questions asked. There's quite a bit of material to cover today, so please go ahead and use that Q&A function to ask your questions and my fellow staff members will answer you. If you have a question on something that I've just mentioned in the presentation, please feel free to go ahead and ask that question. There will also be time at the end for final questions as well. And within this presentation, we do have quite a bit of web links and resources. So after this webinar, we will be sending the slides out to all of the folks who attended, just to let you know. So as Jody mentioned, we are part of a nationwide network that provides businesses with the know-how and technical tools to perform successful, successfully for federal, state, and local government contracts. You may have already heard of our services before. Uh, we are formerly known as PTAC, but we still do the exact same thing. Jessica. we go. <laughs> you have given me some guff, you guys. I have a list here of my contact information as well as the contact information of my fellow panelists here today. With me is Brandon McCall and Judy Sayers, and they have a wealth of experience in federal contracting, and I'm so glad to have them with me today. Our service region encompasses 19 counties, which are, are, which are listed here. Land, Buchanan, Carol, Craig, Floyd, Dickinson, Giles, Grayson, Lee, Montgomery, Patrick, Pulaski, Russell, Scott, Smith, Taswell, Washington, Wise, and Whip. We also cover four cities, Galax, Bradford, Bristol, and Norton. We're hosted by Southwest Virginia Community College and we're located on the SWCC campus. However, we do cover such a large region that doesn't mean that we can only help you over the phone or internet, though we are certainly happy to do that. If you need us to come visit you either at your business or at another site, we are happy to do that. We are able to do that through our partnership with five other community colleges, Mountain Empire, Virginia Highlands, New River, Patrick and Henry, and well, Patrick and Henry at the Stewart location, I should say. We are able to use their resources and offices there as well to meet with businesses who need our technical assistance. So please don't feel like if maybe you are further away from where we are in Tazewell County that you can't meet with us. We are happy to accommodate you. And do not despair if you happen to be on the call and you are not part of our service region. It is a statewide program and there are two other Apex Accelerators. And if you're not sure which one um, is available to help you, we can help you figure that out too. We can help you with registrations and that can be for state or federal, which we're touching on today. Certifications such as SWAM or SBA socioeconomic programs, market research tools, contracting regulations, solicitation and proposal reviews, and we have training events all the time. In fact, we have one tomorrow, which I'll tell you a little bit about before we're over today. And best of all, all of our services are free. You don't have to pay anything at all for our assistance. And here included in the slide, I also have the service regions for the other two Apex accelerators. So when you get those slides after the webinar, if you need to find one, it's here readily available for you. And if you want to register for us, if you're in our service region, we will have our link here as well. So to get to our main topic today, I'm going to start with a part one. What is FEMA? What sorts of products and services do they buy? 
FEMA stands for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It is within the Office of Department of Homeland Security, and their mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. Their legal authority is the Robert T. Stafford Act. Regulations for implementing the Robert T. Stafford Act indicate that when practical and feasible, FEMA's goal is to seek local companies within the disaster area for goods and services related to that specific disaster. And I want to state up front now at the beginning of the presentation, it's important to understand that FEMA doesn't wait until disasters happen to buy services and products. Their priority is to have access to a large pool of businesses that can mobilize quickly when they need it. And because a disaster has happened doesn't mean there's going to be a flood of contracting opportunities to bid on. FEMA buys products and services on a continual basis. And they tend to work in advanced contracts, which we'll touch on in more detail later in the presentation. And those contracts are typically for several years. If you're just starting out in your journey and you want to bid on opportunities with FEMA, you have to know that you need to be diligent in doing your research about when contracts end for services you provide and knowing how to respond when FEMA is doing their own market research before they post their opportunities. It's likely not a short-term process, but a long-term process in which you have to do your research and you have to be prepared. We have quite a few tools listed in this presentation to help you with that. To understand what aspects of the federal government respond to various needs during a disaster and knowing who's in charge of buying what products and what services, it's really helpful to understand the emergency response framework. The emergency response framework describes federal coordinating structures that group resources and capabilities into functional areas most frequently needed in a national response. To summarize, this table explains what government entity oversees what aspect of disaster recovery. It takes a lot of moving parts to respond to disasters and FEMA can't do it all. If you're looking for opportunities on SAM.gov and you're only looking for Department of Homeland Security or FEMA listings, you're not going to see all of the contracts you may be interested in pursuing. An example I bolded here is public works and engineering. This encompasses construction and debris removal, which people are typically very interested in contracts for. As you can see here though, FEMA is not the entity in charge of those contracts. The US Army Corps of Engineers is. So they would be listed under the Department of Defense. So this table is really helpful in just understanding who's in charge of what, how do I find what I'm looking for? And again, I have also bolded here what FEMA is in charge of. So things like logistics, information and planning, search and rescue, um, emergency assistance, temporary housing and human services, those kinds of things. The top commodities that the government buys in a disaster are infant and toddler products, durable medical equipment kits, consumable medical equipment kits, plastic sheeting, tarps, blankets, comfort wear hygiene kits, water, shredded bins, portable toilets, language services, meals, forklift rentals, cargo vans, generators, cots, leased copiers, office supplies, temporary labor, security guard services, and janitorial services. The top services procured in a disaster response are debris removal. And again, for that, you want to be in touch with the Army Corps of Engineers. At the end of the presentation, though today is mostly about FEMA, I have listed some resources and, and information for the Army Corps of Engineers, simply because things like construction and debris removal are usually pretty popular topics, and we wanted to make sure to include that. The other top services are transportation services, which we have a link to as well and transitional sheltering assistance services, so hotels and motels. 
can participate in FEMA's Transitional Sheltering Assistance Program, which offers rooms to disaster survivors seeking housing aid. Um, and you can visit that link as well. So part two, now that you know what sort of things FEMA is buying, how do you actually do business with them? And the most important and initial step, you need to register with SAM.gov. SAM.gov is an official site of the U.S. government for the System for Award Management, which businesses must use to do business with the United States government, and registration is free. Registration also has three parts. You need to create an individual account. You need to validate your business to get a unique entity identifier, otherwise known as a UEI. And you need to register your business to get a CAGE code. CAGE codes are, are required. They're how the government identifies your business. You must have a valid UEI and CAGE code to do business with the government. You must have both. We also have a handy link with the steps and also a tip line and live chat, but we will be walking you through the steps here as well. So initially, you'll want to go to www.sam.gov and click get started. From here, you will want to click create new entity. And then from there, you will want to click directly with the U.S. government. On the next screen, select the answer that best fits your intentions today. You will want to select bid on a federal procurement opportunity as a prime contractor. When it asks who required your entity to be in SAM.gov, you will select the federal government. From here, it's going to ask you if you want to have the ability to bid on all awards and to do business with FEMA, you must select this. It'll ask you, are you registering a government entity? Most folks will say no. After you select no, it's going to ask you if your entity is physically located in the U.S. I think most people in here would say yes. It's going to ask you if you already have a CAGE code. If you do, you will click yes and provide it. I think most people, if you're new, would say no. And then it's going to confirm the information that you have just entered. At this point, you will see a module here, and these are all the steps you must complete to be able to be active in SAM.gov. The first step, get a unique entity ID. It's going to ask you some information about your business, such as the name and where it's located. It's then going to tell you you're about to validate your entity. And there's a tick box here that says, I can provide official documentation if necessary to validate my entity. Sometimes you will have to submit documents, some people won't, and I'll go into here who will and who won't. At this point, it's going to produce a list of legal entities. If you see your business listed here, go ahead and select it. If you don't, you'll click, I don't recognize my entity in this list, at which point you are going to have to provide more information and you are going to have to submit some documents. It's going to ask you your incorporation information. It's going to, again, confirm the information that you've provided them. And from here, it's going to give you a list of requirements of what they will need to validate your entity. There's a list of official documents that you can scan and attach, of course. We have a list here. I'm not going to read all of them, but generally speaking, you are going to need a document from list A and a document from list B. List C is only for international companies, so I don't think anybody in here would need to worry about that. This is essentially the flow of how entity validation works, and as you can see, 
If all of your details are correct and you don't have to upload any documents, you're going to be validated a fair bit quicker than if you have to submit the documents. Um, new incidents currently take about seven calendar days for them to provide you a UDI, but of course that can vary depending on different circumstances. That's just an average. So after all that, you have gotten that unique entity ID code. The rest of the information you're filling out here is what will end up giving you that cage code. For data, it's going to ask you your entity business information, such as the start date, fiscal year end close date, your entity division name, division number, and URL your physical and mailing address, your IRS consent and taxpayer information, your EIN or social security number, which will depend on the structure of your business, your taxpayer name, address, tax year, the name of the individual executing consent and the title of the individual executing consent. You'll wanna provide your ownership details. Does another entity own or control the, ent the entity being registered? And predecessor details. Are you a successor to a predecessor that holds a federal contractor grant within the last three years? It'll also ask you some gen general information, financial information, executive compensation questions, and proceedings questions. It'll also ask you your points of contact for people such as your accounts receivable, electronic business, government business, sole proprietorship <laughs> or partnership if applicable, if you're an LLC or a corporation that wouldn't apply. And then any other additional points of contacts. So if you have more than one person, for example, you can include them as well. You will then get to the tab called assertions. And this is, especially relevant today because this is where you are going to click that you want to be included in the disaster response registry, which is where FEMA pulls from when they are looking for businesses to do business with. There is some other information you also have to provide on this tab though, which I'll go through as well, but I will spend a little bit extra time on the disaster response information portion. It's going to ask you about goods and services. You'll have to set up your company's North American Industry Classification System Code, otherwise known as an ACE code, including design, designating your primary NACE code as well as product and service codes. It's going to ask you your size metrics by inputting your annu annual receipts and number of employees. It's going to ask you about your electronic data exchange information and then it's going to ask you disaster response information. So if you want to be listed in the registry, which you have to be to do business with FEMA, to do things like provide removal, supplies, reconstruction, you will have to fill this out. For the size standards, a size standard, which is usually stated in number of employees or average annual receipts represents the largest size that a business including its subsidiaries and affiliates may be to remain classified as a small business for SBA and federal contracting programs. And the definition of small will vary by industry. Size standards are mostly based on the average annual receipts or the average number of employees. And the way that you know which one you are supposed to use will depend on your NACE code. As you can see here, somebody who uses the NACE code for natural gas distribution will go by their number of employees, but somebody using water supply and irrigation systems, they would go by their average annual receipts. If you are not sure or you need some help, we have a link here to help explain that process. Or of course, you can reach out to your Apex Accelerator and they would be happy to help you figure that out as well. So your initial steps for the disaster response registry. Um, again, it lists contractors able to provide essential supplies and services to affected areas in a disaster. How do you add your company to it? 
That selection lies within the assertions module in SAM.gov. Once your registration is complete and active, your company will be added to the registry. On average, it takes two to three days to properly register and have your registration become active in SAM. It might take longer. So it'll probably be a couple days before you show up in the registry. During the registration process, you must indicate you want to participate in the disaster response registry and provide the required information on the disaster response information page within the assertions module. Once your registration is active, you'll be added to the registry and contracting officers will be able to locate your company through that search. What information will the disaster response registry collect? SAM.gov collects two pieces of information from contractors wanting to be listed in the registry. Your bonding level, if applicable. The Federal Acquisi Acquisition Regulation FAR, Part 28, requires performance bonds on construction contracts that exceed $150,000. Payment bonds are required on jobs valued over $35,000 with few exceptions. Of course, each solicitation may be different, but in general, that's who will require bonds. And a bond, if you're just not aware with that terminology, it's a written instrument executed, executed by a bidder or a contractor and a second party to assure fulfillment of the obligations to a third party. And in this case, the third party would be the government identified in the bond. And if the obligations aren't met, the bond assures payment to the extent stipulated. If, of course, you wouldn't be doing any product or service that would meet that threshold or those stipulations, this is not something that would be applicable to you, but just in case it is, I've included it. And it's going to ask you the geographic area served. So when entering your geographic area into the disaster response registry, you're stating your organization can go and work as a contractor where there is a FEMA declared disaster in that area and you can provide disaster response services. So you would want to make sure that when you're filling that out, that whatever you're saying you can provide or whatever product you can provide, you can do it in that area. And again, a little more about bonding level. So bonding level refers to a contractor's construction or service bonding level, which is expressed in dollars. Um, a construction bonding level, the level of bonding for construction, which can be per contract or aggregate, and service bonding level, the level of bonding for services, which can be per contract or aggregate. And the bonding level would be provided by the contractor via a letter from their bonding company. And bonding levels are important because they assure the U.S. government that contractors can meet their requirements. After you fill that out, it's going to ask you about representations and certifications. And those are written guarantees made by entities or businesses to sponsoring agencies to comply with various requirements and are required for the conducting of business with the federal government. These will be a series of questions for which you will be required to answer with each referring a particular clause within the FAR. By answering these questions during your initial registration and updating your responses if necessary during your annual renewals, it will save you from having to answer these again every time you wish to submit a bid. Review of FAR and DFAR provisions. There will be provided links to each provision from the Federal Acquisition Regulation and Defense Acquisition Regulation that you will click on and read over on sound.gov. And I know, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, sometimes when we are doing things online, we just go ahead and agree and we skip over and we don't read it. Do not do that with these. You need to really understand what you are agreeing to because they will legally hold you to it. So please read and understand what you are agreeing to before you click that you agree to it. And that's what that will look like. So once you have done all that, when you log in, if you are fully validated and you have your UEI and your cage code, you will look like this first graphic with the check mark. 
if you don't look like that, that means you are not fully validated yet. And again, just to reiterate, you must be fully validated to be able to do any sort of business with FEMA. Previously, I mentioned the Disaster Response Registry. You can use that as a business. It is also available to you. Um, you can view it, for example, if you want to look for prime contractors who sell a product that you provide and they're already in the registry, maybe you want to look for subcontracting opportunities, you can certainly use the registry to look for those. To be able to view the registry yourself from your workspace, you'll select Home in the upper menu, select Entity Registration from the main page, You'll select advanced search from the magnifying glass on the search bar. And in the filter box on the left, you'll select domain and then disaster response registry. The results page will load. And then from there, you can filter to different things that may be of interest to you, such as keywords, a business name, a geographic location, an entity type. If they have certain socioeconomic certifications, what sort of products they provide, things of that nature. So you can also use that to your benefit as well. And that is what the page will look like when you get to it. And as you can see, you can filter from there. There are other tools you can utilize to assist in doing business with FEMA. You really want to continually monitor SAM.gov for open opportunities for things like industry days, vendor outreach, APFS and advanced contracts and responding to RFIs when sources are being sought. You can also complete a FEMA ILP vendor profile form. Be sure to include detailed information to describe your company capabilities and other commodities the form is located at a link here in these slides. The form is voluntary and the information provided should not be proprietary or sensitive, but failure to provide the requested information may delay or prevent FEMA from sharing information related to the information liaison program with you. And what that program does is it manages information about doing business with FEMA, like outreach and market research and like those industry days, if you want that information, it's a really good idea to fill out that form. It also gives them information about your business so they're aware of you. So you wanna really make sure that you stress your business's capabilities. You can also, from the vendor profile form, request a meeting with a FEMA representative. And the purpose of your VFP submission, if the purpose is you want to have a meeting with a representative, a representative, you really want to indicate any specific program of interest so that way they know who to best connect you with. Now, you don't need to fill out a vendor profile form to bid on a FEMA contract, but it is something available to you that is incredibly helpful. It also doesn't guarantee you any contracts, but again, it's something there that can help you, especially as you're trying to wade through all of the information. Another really important tool that you should utilize are, is something called a source of sought notice. And what those are, if you're unaware, they're a synopsis posted by a government agency to identify potential sources for a project. And it's a tool that they use to conduct market research. It's not a request for proposals or a solicitation for work. If you respond to it, what you do is you're helping them learn if the requirement and the evaluation process is realistic. So what they're seeing is, is are there businesses out there who can do what we're asking? Um, and if capable small businesses don't respond, you may lose a potential set aside. If they post a source of thought and several small businesses respond to it and they see that, hey, we have some options here, of, of people that we can go with, they are more likely to set that aside for small businesses. If nobody responds to it, it'll just be open to anyone. And you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage, especially 
So it's a very good idea, even though it's no guarantee of anything, it's a good idea to do it for that reason. And it's a good idea to get more information about the project and to make those contacts with different contracting officers. Advanced contracts. So FEMA advanced contracts for goods and services are competed and awarded in advance of major disaster declarations to provide efficient, cost-effective means for rapid delivery of supplies and services for reoccurring disaster response and recovery and recover, recovery requirements. In um, FY 2024, FEMA has currently 103 advanced contracts in 48 mission essential areas. And most FEMA contracts are advanced contracts. And again, it just helps them assure responsiveness when disasters happen. There are several in place until 2025 or 2027. However, again, if you start now, you're going to be in a better place to bid for those opportunities by answering sources sought attending vendor fairs and making connections with relevant contracting offices. To see a complete list of FEMA advanced contracts, we have a link provided. We also have some screenshots here just to give folks an idea. Things that we have highlighted with a star are of particular note to those who may be wanting to work with FEMA. Um, currently there are six advanced contracts for temporary housing. Um, manufactured beds, um, that transitional sheltering assistance program for things like hotels and motels. Um, TARPs, transportation services of different sorts. And of course, you know, different things like equipment rentals, more TARPs, um, medical equipment kits. generators. Bottled water, things of that nature. Here we have the contact information for Region 3, which would be Virginia. Um, if there's anybody here who happens to be from the state of Tennessee, you would actually be in Region 4. But we have their contact information here. If you have any questions, you can reach out to them by phone or email. And now um, I wanted to touch a bit on the US Army Corps of Engineers, because again, that is something we get a lot of questions about. They, much like FEMA, maintain a framework of contractors um, under contract to help in disasters to facilitate rapid engagement. And those contracts are part of the UCACE, Advanced Contracting Initiative, a program developed and implemented specifically for emergencies and disaster scenarios. And the suite of targeted contract tools provides the Corps of Engineers with a rapid response capability to meet the needs in disasters, again, things like bottled water, packaged ice, debris removal, and temporary roofing. We have some helpful links here as well. They play, again, a huge part in storm recovery. If you want to do business with the Corps, you have a capability submission page to inform the Corps about your business and let them know about what you are capable of doing. There is a link there where you can submit that. They also maintain a database, much like the Disaster Relief Recovery Database that FEMA has. To be added to their database, their link is located here on this slide. Information for contracting and disasters, including the Corps of Engineers Advanced Contracts, which they have as well, is located at that link. And we also have a handy Roadmap to Success, which incorporates all of these links, as well as some other helpful tips that they have put together which we've included here for you as well. So in, in a nutshell, as you all can see, FEMA and disaster recovery in general, they buy a wide, wide range of products and services. Essentially anything you can think of, they need it. 
Again, though, you just want to be made aware it's not something that you can immediately do right after a disaster. They simply don't work that way. However, again, by knowing how to use the tools on SAM.gov and the tools that FEMA has provided, you will be able to position yourself to be able to compete and win those contracts when they become available. If you happen to have a business and maybe you have gone through this process and you don't seem to be having much luck, I would highly recommend contacting your local Apex Accelerator, having them look over things like your capabilities statement before you submit a proposal, have them look it over. Those are all services they provide and for free. And that can also be a huge benefit and assistance when you are trying to get your foot in the door. So at this time, um, if there are any final questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And again, we will be sending this PowerPoint out to, to all um, folks who, who came here today. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I think we do have some questions that have popped in. Brandon and Judy have, and uh, Sheila have done a great job of, of answering some, but I'm going to go ahead and read you some of the other questions and maybe uh, between the three of you, you can, you can help <laughs> um, answer the questions. So uh, the first one is um, if you're already, whoops, this is my, this is going to be my challenge here. Um, if you're a new business, can you still sign up without annual receipts or active employees, or do you need to have a, a track record before you sign up? Jessica? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, you'll, you'll have to provide them with something. Um, and to be honest, a, a track record is really only what the government has to go on to know anything about you. If you're a new business and you don't have really a track record to be able to show them that you can reliably provide the products and services, you're not going to have much luck. Um, what I would recommend in that case, and Judy and Brandon, feel free to, um, you know, chime in here. Um, but if you're brand new, before you really jump into the federal marketplace, I would really look into maybe things like, if possible, state or local procurement, build up your services, um, because really that's what is going to get you those contracts. They don't necessarily, I mean, it would be very hard for the federal government to be like, well, let's give a contract to someone and we, we don't really know what they're capable of, so. Yeah, typically the, the rule uh, that I always tell people is that you're looking at two years before you're really ready to play in the government space in terms of the federal government. So again, using the state opportunities is the best course to build that past performance and that experience that gets you to where you need to be to start working with the federal government. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, my company has a SAM.gov account, but for the initial process, I didn't select to register for the disaster registry. How can I edit my active account to reflect my interest to participate? Jessica or Judy? I know that you you certainly can. Um, we may have to do a little search here and we will put that in the chat to let you know um, okay. for you to be able to update your profile. It's definitely not like a one and done opportunity <laughs> to, to put yourself in the registry. Jessica, can I add something? Um, Please do. When you want to update your SAM account, so you would go uh, to your account and go to your home to your your um, home page where your contract is listed. I mean, where your company name is listed. Click on that company name, and then you will have an opportunity to uh, to click on either delete or update. And those are and it's hard to explain, but there's three little dots on the right 
uh, on your page there that you're looking at, click on update and it will let you go in and update what you need to. Typically go though, you're going to have to look at every page uh, just to make sure that everything's okay. So um, that anyway, those three buttons there on the right and the tiny little dots, click on those and that's where you'll see the update button. However, if you want to call us, we can certainly walk you through that process. Great. Uh, we've got a number of questions related to specific kinds of um, services, like are there specific instructions for ground ambulance or medical transport services? Um, is there a need for alternative dispute resolution, such as mediation? Um, and Jessica, you mentioned that FEMA is not the only agency buying services for disaster recovery, um, but for things like for instance, ground ambulance and medical transport services. Is that through FEMA or is that through another agency? That would be Department of Transportation. Okay. Um, yes. So that is who you would want to look for those opportunities under. And are things like alternative dispute resolution, mediation services, are those uh, services that you've seen that uh, would be important or pur purchased during um, disaster recovery? That is not something that I have personally seen. That doesn't mean that it's not. Um, okay. It may be something that they maybe don't do as often, but I would, I would look because it deals in mediation. Um, if not FEMA, if you are looking for an opportunity for something like that, perhaps look under the um, Department of Justice. Um, and see if there's anything listed there that may require mediation or a mediator. I think that would be your best bet. Great. Um, let me see if we've got other questions coming in here that might be helpful. Um, I also wanted to mention as well, um, somebody who had spoken about ambulance services, et cetera, um, on the slide in which we showed some of the advanced contracts, there is an advanced contract listed there for ambulance services. So that may be of interest to someone who does ambulance transport. You may want to look at that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any feedback or recommendations, Jessica, that local governments can do to, um, provides uh, or to contact businesses who want to be a participate in the recovery? Really for local um, governments and things of that nature, most, most opportunities that they would be dealing with, it would not be through FEMA, it would just be through maybe state or county organizations. And you would really find those on your state procurement. I'm having such a hard time with that word today. And that's a word I say so often. State procurement. In this case, it would be EVA. I would look on EVA um, entities such as the Virginia Department of Transportation, things of that nature would be your best bet in finding those um, or, any or any representatives from those agencies would be your best bet. Okay. That's um, get that out of the way here. And then maybe a, a, some information or perspective or how soon can a contractor get a FEMA contract? And is the process expedited for this disaster? To be honest, not, not really. FEMA does not work on the timeline of a disaster happens, now we react. They are always reacting. They are always publishing solicitations, looking at contracts, and their contracts are long-term simply because it benefits them more to have someone who they know they can rely on for an X amount of time to be able to provide a service. Generally speaking, and again, it can depend on where your business is um, size-wise and what kind of service you provide, it can generally take a, a couple of years, depending. And some of the contracts we listed today for advanced contracts, again, some are ending in 2025, some in 2027. 
the best thing you can do is just become knowledgeable of the process of knowing what contracts are out there when they end and preparing and positioning yourself to be able to be responsive right away when the solicitations go out. They go out through throughout the entire year for different for different things. As I mentioned before, it's not really a flood of contracting opportunities after a disaster happens. That's just not the way these agencies work because they can't work that way. Um, if they did, then hardly anything would get done. So really the best thing you can do is to become knowledgeable and don't be scared of SAM.gov. Learn the different tools and things available to you. Great. And Judy, you can feel free to chime in as well. That's fine. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when you are talking about working with the, the federal government, I mean, where the uh, individual agencies uh, uh, are wanting to provide something, I think they would go to the State Office of Emergency Services and coordinate with them to decide where they would be needed. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's important just to re-emphasize this is um, also about business preparedness. So kind of familiarizing yourself with the process as Jessica mentioned um, and getting ready to respond um, with your goods and services for future opportunities is also important. Um, this is not the last time that there will be a, a natural disaster event. Um, this season for hurricanes is not over yet. Uh, so there's there's always future opportunities and the immediacy may not be uh, may, might not be right there, but there are definitely opportunities for you to prepare for for future um, for future business. I've put up on this on the screen uh, to share just some of the uh, additional contacts to make sure you're aware FEMA.gov registering with SAM, SAM.gov, the website contacts for the Southwest Virginia Apex, the Crater Apex, and the Virginia Apex, all of the resources in Virginia to help you as a government contractor. If you're interested in meeting with a local small business development center, um, we've got a link here for you to request an appointment. We work really closely with Apex. Um, so for those of you who are new in business and may not have those two years under your, under your belt yet in, in uh, business um, operations, we can certainly help you um, uh, um, accelerate that process. But also, like I said, we work really closely with, um, with Apex. If you are a business that has been impacted by the disaster and you're eligible for either a physical loan or economic injury loan, just some deadlines to keep in mind. And again, the SBDC program and network can help you with those. Um, and then if still after this call, um, you have other questions or we didn't get to all of your questions, um, you can send us an email at disaster at Virginia SBDC dot org and uh, we'll make sure that you get that response we'll either connect you up with with our presenters or um, another um, source to get you the information that you need okay, let me just see if we've got any other questions here that we haven't gotten to yet i think we've covered them all um, the team did a great job of answering the questions online as well. Uh, some information about bonding through the U.S. Small Business Administration um, to, to tap into that if you need it. And just some more details on, on the SAM.gov, which I think we've gotten to. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, Jessica, any final comments before we close out? I would say, though I know a lot of what we talk about here is being prepared and positioning yourself, and that can seem overwhelming or maybe even a little disheartening, especially when you're first starting out, but I encourage you not to feel that way. And I also encourage you to pursue this as a resource for your business. Government contracting is a huge benefit, especially to small businesses for reliable sources of income for you and for your business. And we are here and other agencies are here as well as the SBDC to help you sort of navigate 
all of these different things. And while you may feel a bit overwhelmed or not sure where to go or how to start, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. We are here to help you through the process. Wonderful. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Judy Sayers and Brandon McCall uh, for being here this after, this morning. And we will follow up with um, the, this presentation and you can find the uh, recording on our website um, in the coming days. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you. Thank you all.